this is one of the driest places on, on Earth. Sometimes it feels like being on the moon or Mars. During the day is a fantastic place, but during the night is absolutely astonishing. Hi everybody, welcome to another stop in this journey through the extreme universe. We are actually approaching the end of this uh, trip. We only have this webinar and another one, and that would be it for this journey. But today we have a very special webinar. We're going to talk about the most powerful phenomena in the universe, extremely fast, extremely unpredictable, the so-called transient event. And to do that, we have an expert on the matter with us, Francesco Longo, our mission commander, I will introduce in just a couple of minutes. But as usual, as I do in every webinar at the beginning, a reminder, if you have comments or questions, don't be shy. You can write on our Facebook, on YouTube channels during the entire webinar. At the end, we have always this question and answer session that we will gather your questions and Francesco will try to answer that. So without any further, I would like to invite Francesco to join me here on the screen. So ciao, Francesco. Ciao, Alba. I'm fine, and you? I'm Perfect. happy to be here with you this evening. We are glad that you that we have you. So let me introduce you to the audience that uh, doesn't know you. Francesco Longo is an associate professor in experimental physics at the University of Trieste, and he conducts his research at the National Institute for Nuclear Physics, INFN, at the section of uh, Trieste. At the university, he is the coordinator of the PhD in physics, and as a research, he participates in several gamma ray experiments like MAGIC, uh, Agile, Fermilat, SWIGO, and of course, CTA. Actually, he is the former coordinator of the Transient Physics uh, Working Group, and he is an expert on a specific source, gamma ray bursts, and he was working in the field of transients since 1996, I think, so yes. very happy to have That's you true. here to, <laughs> to talk about the, the transients. So I leave you, I, I send you the, the floor, and thanks again, Francesco. Thanks, Alba, for the nice introduction. And so let me say that uh, this top of our journey should be really fast. <laughs> we shall go see the sources and go away. These are the transient sources. The transient sources are, let's say, explosion, big explosion of the highest and most luminous sources in the universe. And so once uh, you have seen them radically exploding, you have witnessed, uh, let's say, the biggest, uh, let's say, disasters in the universe. As it, you can see here from my introduction, you see that there is something originating from a central object of uh, an astronomical object which is exploding uh, and something that is powering uh, energy flowing away from this central object. So these are really dramatic events uh, in the universe uh, and this is why they got my interest since 1996 when I started my, my thesis here at the University of Trieste. So my first message, and I <laughs> say my last message that you can take, is that what happens when, uh, let's say, gamma ray burst explode, one of these explosions happen. So the first message is uh, don't panic. They are, of course, they are not dangerous, uh, at least for what we know, even if, uh, let's say, the, since they are at very large distances, as uh, we know right now, the only problem might be if they explode in the galaxy. <laughs> But uh, as far as we know, there are no, let's say, candidate of these progenitors uh, still active in our galaxy. But of course, the second message of this don't panic uh, is that if you are working one of the experiments that Alba was mentioning, uh, and if you play the role of a burst advocate, uh, you can be called during the night or during the day or whatever. Normally, gamma ray bursts happen when you are, let's say, on holiday or you know, on specific dates. Uh, and then you have to, let's say, act uh, immediately. So luckily, this evening I'm not the burst advocate, uh, and since uh, otherwise I do, I would have uh, to to keep my cell phone open, which uh, have been uh, that they might have been disturbing our webinar. I'm not burst advocate today. I was burst advocate till few days ago for for magic, and I was burst advocate for CTA this summer, for example. So don't panic, because you have uh, to follow a series of procedure and try to get uh, the transient emission from this phenomenon. Of course, this uh, 
might be a very tough work because uh, for gamma ray burst especially these uh, very high energy telescope like cta will be they had the current generation actually they had to wait quite uh, a long time quite 15 years uh, to get the first uh, gamma ray burst to be seen so you can imagine how let's say excited uh, there was the magic collaboration where they detected the first gamma ray burst ever detected in very high energy emission and this is just uh, let's say scientific publication of the first uh, gamma ray burst uh, that exploded on the 14th of january 2019 unfortunately that night <laughs> i should say i kept the cell phone uh, let's say closed so i didn't hear the call that the friends in La Palma called me during the night. I was still uh, the coordinator of the transit working group for, for Magic that day. And uh, so I wasn't, I didn't participate really to the excitement of that night. But I remember very well the date of 15 of January 2019, because on that day I have, uh, let's say, one uh, written exam for engineering or physics students here in the university. And I don't know how I could do that exam because I was so excited, because we waited 15 years uh, to get these uh, gamma ray bursts to be detected. And actually, the experiment was built as such to detect uh, such marvelous and beautiful events. But to understand how and why I'm still excited by this uh, information, you can see that this is a scientific plot, uh, but you can see that uh, this is very largely significant. So the photons coming from this object, they have uh, 700 events over a background of just few. So this is a, an increase in, in this incredible bright uh, source in just half an hour. So this is not uh, typical of uh, the sources that CTA will see, but just of these transient sources, if we will be, let's say, um, good enough to get uh, other of these GRBs. So the outline of my small webinar will be the, the following. I will uh, uh, talk mostly about gamma ray burst because I think that they are the prototypical transient source because they explode you have to react quite quickly you have to get as much information as you can from your data alone eh? but of course uh, the best way to understand this phenomena is to get uh, their information together with other multi-wavelength information and this is nice because this uh, let's say um, not uh, this is not the last stop of our journey the next stop will be on multi-wavelength and multi-messenger to which these transients are closely connected so gamma ray bursts are prototypical in many senses. Then I will move, uh, since we uh, are interested in the very high energy, to the VHA, VHE, sorry, uh, emission. I call that a long expected party because uh, let's say we had to wait, as I, as I said already many times, uh, several years uh, to get the first gamma ray burst to be detected. And then I will just flash you a few of the uh, information that were detected, that were derived from these gamma ray bursts, detected both by Hess and MAGIC in the past years. Then I will go to the key science project of the Cherenkov Telescope Array. This uh, key science project is devoted to transients, where gamma ray bursts uh, play the major role, but they are not the only one. There are other galactic transient sources, and I will uh, just uh, say a few words about two of them. Uh, that, uh, let's say, had uh, the same excitement <laughs> in the past. Uh, the first one is the flaring uh, Crab Nebula. And the second one is actually a, a phenomenon that is happening in binary system of uh, sources, uh, which are called uh, the Nova Explosion, as uh, I will say you later on. And then I will say a few words about uh, flaring AGNs uh, that, uh, let's say, might be connected to multi-messenger uh, transient uh, emission as well. And uh, I will close my webinar with uh, just a few words uh, of a new era that might be open and in transients for sure, and hopefully in very high energy transit. But I will not scoop my last uh, few slides because I think that this might be one of the uh, subjects where CTA might uh, make some big discoveries. So let's start the history of gamma ray burst. So gamma ray burst, uh, let's say, where they were detected by chance, I should say. Not with the excitement that I am trying to convey to you, but uh, with some fear, I should say, because uh, they were discovered by some secret military satellites named the Vela satellites that operated during the Cold War. They were, let's say, designed to see whether the other, let's say, countries were emitting uh, 
they were testing nuclear bombs, and the nuclear bombs emit gamma rays in the uh, G, in the MeV range. So they are these are much uh, lower energies of photons with respect to the uh, gamma rays that CTA will detect. Uh, CTA will detect. Uh, photons of uh, a million times more energetic than these. Uh, gamma ray bursts are namely photons uh, around uh, one mega electron volt, uh, while CTA will see more or less one tera electron volt, so one million times uh, more energetic. But they were detected by these, uh, let's say, secret satellites, uh, and this took uh, almost uh, six years uh, to publish the first paper. This is the first paper in the history of, of science of the observation of gamma ray bursts of cosmic origin origin. They recognized that they didn't come from the Earth, and luckily enough, they were smart enough to calculate properly their direction, because otherwise we would not have been here, and the third world war was already exploded, I think. So this is the first detected gamma ray burst. It is the Vela 4E event on July the 2nd, 1967. I was not yet born in that time, but uh, from this very old graph uh, that I took from a presentation of one of the first uh, um, people that uh, wrote the article that I was showing you before, you see that uh, this has a first spike that lasts one second, then uh, the emission goes back to the background level, then there is another episode that uh, uh, goes down more, uh, let's say, silently. And this is typical of uh, the gamma ray burst, where we have some spikes uh, of different duration, of different, uh, let's say, length in time. And uh, you have a first sharp uh, increase and then a more smooth decline with, uh, let's say, several tens of seconds. But you see that uh, how many counts you have, they are an incredible number. So just to show you this in a more better way, this is an animated GIF, and this repeats. In nature, the gamma ray bursts do not repeat. Once you have seen them, they disappear completely. So you might imagine that you have an experiment uh, that is counting, uh, let's say, a few thousand second per, uh, counts per second, and then all of a sudden, you have 30,000 counts per second from an unknown direction in the sky. And you, know, you don't know what is causing this incredible explosion of gamma rays. So you might imagine when I was a student, uh, that professor of, with which I, with who I, I studied, uh, gave me this, uh, let's say, this plot, uh, and this was really uh, enthusiastically, uh, let's say, moving me toward this, uh, this study. At that time, when I started, gamma ray bursts were not yet known if they were galactic, uh, so if they were originating in our galaxy, or if they were extragalactic, so coming from, from abroad. So how this wa study was done? There were several dedicated missions from NASA, for example. This is uh, the BATSI experiment that flew on the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory mission in the early, let's say, on the, sorry, in the late 90s. And it had one experiment called BATSI, Burst and Transient Source Experiment, that worked in the energy range typical for gamma ray burst, up to few mega electron volt. And this experiment made a few interesting discoveries. Let, let me show what they are, because this is the status of the gamma reverse when I started. You have to think that this kind of historical introduction is important to understand why the uh, Cherenkov telescope are so interested in gamma reverse right now. So you see that gamma reverse have the all different uh, origins. So you have all different uh, shapes of light curves, so uh, counts versus uh, time. You see there is no one equal to the other. They are something, they are as long as 40 seconds, something are a few seconds, something less than one second. So you can imagine that uh, people at that time were not able to classify them. Each burst is different from each other. So how one can progress in the science? And what they did in the Batse era was try to somehow um, discriminate among gamma ray bursts that, are, that have a general duration less than two seconds, which are called short duration bursts, from the bursts that are longer than two seconds, more or less, which are called the long duration burst. At that time, this division was purely based on the duration only. There were no, let's say, other hints of different nature of these two kinds of phenomena. So how the uh, science progressed? It progressed thanks to several observations, and this is uh, one of them. On board of the same mission, there was another experiment called IGRET that detected high energy photons. This is a photon of 10 to the 4 MeV. So 
10, uh, 10,000 more energetic than the photons of the uh, normal burst. And this uh, photon came just uh, after more than one hour after the burst. So how it is possible that a phenomena just uh, lasting 100 seconds can still emit photons at 10,000 more energetic one hour later? At that time, was this was, let's say, practically in, impossible to describe. This was one of the mystery of gamma ray burst in, uh, let's say, in the uh, late uh, in the late nineties. Of course, uh, one key observation of Batsy was the location on the sky. Each of these black dots is a gamma ray burst. The our Milky Way should have been placed in the center of this plot. Okay, at uh, let's say here will be the galactic center. Here there will be the galaxy. And all of these gamma ray bursts are placed uh, everywhere on the sky. So there is no preferred direction on the sky. And this is typical of the external galaxies. The external galaxies, uh, let's say the faraway galaxy in the cosmology are, um, let's say, placed like that. So in order to discuss if they were galactic or extragalactic, in the 1995, so 75 years after the great debate for which the external galaxies were discovered, that these two scientists discussed whether they were cosmological or galactic. And this is just a few numbers. If you have a certain flux of a certain energy per square the centimeter squared per, per second, this corresponds, if they are cosmological, to a huge energy, like uh, the energy that is emitted by the sun or a fraction of the sun in its entire life, which is uh, an enormous quantity of energy. Or otherwise, if they are more close by, they are, let's say, still, let's say, energetic uh, phenomena, but not so, uh, let's say, extreme. And since this is a journey through the extreme universe, uh, you might imagine which of the solution I prefer at that time. Uh, I prefer to be uh, to be in favor of cosmological. Unfortunately, I had the thesis uh, to confirm whether they were galactic, and I did some <laughs> let's say some measurements, uh, and uh, okay, they may be consistent with the galactic origin of uh, of gamma ray burst. And uh, let's say uh, why I was so interested because there were two different models. One for galactic uh, gamma ray burst was involving neutron stars, so the dead end of stars, when they explode, they leave after them a core of neutrons, more or less of neutrons, with a huge magnetic field. And these were known phenomena in the galaxy. On the other side, if they were extragalactic, let's say one could, uh, let's say, find some the coalescence of two neutron stars, two of them, let's say that uh, um, uh, orbiting one around each other, then they, they clashed at the end to form one black hole. So I was searching for the gravitational wave signal from this merger of neutron stars. And since I didn't find any, OK, this was still consistent with the galactic origin of uh, gamma ray burst. To my, <laughs> let's say, uh, enthusiasm at some point, but I had to throw away, or not to throw, but let's say to rewrite part of the thesis. Uh, in 1997, when I was already working on the thesis, uh, one key measurement came from the Italian Dutch BEPOSAC satellite of the Italian Space Agency that measured for the first time the key observation of gamma ray burst. This uh, experiment had two, two um, uh, small experiments devoted to gamma ray burst, the one in uh, green here and the one here in, in yellow. So in uh, 28th of February, 1997, I will always remember that day or a few days after, when the discoverer of this emission, Enrico Costa from Rome, he called my professor a few days after and said, OK, we found the source of gamma ray burst. How? You see here, there is a source of X-rays well, very well located with two arc minutes, okay, which is very small. Uh, well, let's say the full moon on, uh, on the sky is half of a degree. One arc minute is one over 60. Uh, one arc minute is one over 60 degrees. So it is very small with compared to a full moon. So this was the first time that uh, a source uh, was located with such uh, small uh, precision. But how we know that this was associated with gamma ray burst? Because it was detected by one of the two experiments on board the EPOSAX uh, consistently with the gamma ray burst. But moreover, a few days after, when this uh, professor called uh, my, my teacher, 
uh, Guido Barbellini, uh, he's the name of my teacher, he, he told him, and he told him, okay, Guido, we found the, the source, because a few days after, this is March 3, you see that the source has completely disappeared. And this was the discovery of the so-called afterglow emission. So the emission that comes after the first uh, impulsive, very impulsive phenomenon of gamma ray burst that lasts uh, much longer, days, uh, weeks, uh, even months uh, in other wavelengths. So this uh, let, uh, this uh, observation by Beto Sachs, let uh, the observer, you see here there are these uh, blue circles. These are the location on the sky of few degrees, much more than several moons, uh, on the sky, so you can imagine that it was not possible to find any counterpart of this object. And this, uh, instead, is the location of the Beppo Sachs instruments uh, that is much, much smaller than with, uh, the, the previous uh, measurements. And this led uh, to the identification, for example, of the host galaxies. And this point here that I am now showing with the mouse, I hope that you can see that, uh, this is uh, the optical counterpart uh, that is left over for the gamma ray burst. So the gamma ray burst is uh, brighter than the entire galaxy. So these are extreme, really extreme phenomena. This uh, was uh, an observation by the Hubble Space Telescope in the very early afterglow year. So how is uh, this possible? Because at that time, a network of satellites was set up. So there were several satellites and also other were added in, in the following. That sent uh, the location of the gamma ray burst to the ground. This was sent around uh, through the internet to all the sites. Nowadays, uh, 2021, this is, seems um, quite obvious, but this is, uh, was uh, designed in the, uh, in the 90s, where none of us were still connected with Wi Fi every, wi -Fi everywhere. So, this is, was uh, really a key point in gamma ray burst science. And you see that in this very old picture, there is already a TV site. Uh, that uh, was expected to repoint uh, to the gamma ray burst direction when, once they are discovered by one of these space satellites. So let me tell you a few more words about the afterglows. Uh, this is the prompt uh, curve. Uh, forget about uh, the curve, but it is very large number of counts. Uh, and then later on, Beppo Sachs was able to discover the long-weighted emission, which is called the afterglow, that lasts much more time. And uh, this allowed uh, the, tele the other telescope to pinpoint uh, these, uh, these uh, sources. So nowadays, what we know, we know that they are cosmological sources. But it's not the end of the story. Because on 25th of April, <laughs> here in Italy is somehow an holiday on that day, 25th of April in 1998, one gamma ray burst, quite um, normal, I should say, with just, uh, let's say, one single pulse, uh, was discovered by Beppo Sachs. Uh, and, uh, Together with that, a supernova, so an exploding star, was detected in a very nearby galaxy. So this uh, pointed uh, to the confirmation of one of the possible progenitor. So the possible progenitor of gamma ray burst, sorry, it is still written in Italian. So the gamma ray burst progenitor are, an, uh, at least for some of them, the long duration one, uh, they are an exploding star that uh, leaves behind it uh, a black hole, possibly, and the jet of relativistic particles emitted by the newly born black hole. So the story didn't end, of course, uh, when I graduated, but it continued. And uh, NASA, detect, uh, let's say, prepared another mission, which was called SWIFT. And now it is named after its first and very, uh, he was a friend, a really close friend, also many of us. Uh, the Professor Neil Gerrels. Now it is called the Neil Gerrels Swift Gamma Ray Burst Mission. And this has the possibility to get uh, the burst with the four arc minutes in 10 seconds. Then the satellite immediately is due to the position detected by this telescope. These make an extra image. These locate with less than five, sec uh, five arc seconds, sorry, even one. Uh, 60 of a uh, dark minute, and if the birds cooperate, also in optical in less than a few minutes. And these data are immediately public for everyone. So uh, SWIFT is really a fantastic mission, I should say, in gamma ray burst. And uh, the history after Beppo Sachs really changed with SWIFT. So this uh, came, uh, let's say, to the, uh, the introduction of why the very high energy mission was a long expected party. Because, uh, for example, MAGIC uh, telescopes, these are the current picture of the two 
uh, 17 meters telescope in the high mountain of La Palma in the Canary Island. They were designed to detect gamma ray bursts. They can move uh, around uh, at all degrees uh, in every location on the sky in less than one minute. And you see this very old publication. It is uh, 20, 2005, so just one year after SWIFT was launched. This is the gamma ray burst, and magic was to the point uh, 50 seconds after. So I'm trying to catch uh, the, imp the impulsive event. And of course, here we, can, we could place just upper limits. The same happened to Hess telescope. Now this is the actual picture with the, the four, let's say, telescope and the biggest S2 telescope in the middle of 28 meters of diameter. In that time, when this observation that I'm showing, there was just the four telescopes. And they were quite unlucky because they could, uh, maybe I don't remember the name, the exact date, but they could point to the burst just at 1,000 seconds after, maybe it was uh, during the, the early part of the night. So they missed uh, the initial part, uh, and they placed upper limit just to the plateau phase uh, in the afterglow, which is typical of the swift gamma ray burst, but they didn't take the initial part. So it was something really <laughs> quite impossible to, to detect. Uh, we were both quite unlucky. Of course, the story didn't end because nowadays uh, there are other telescopes like uh, Fermi that Alba mentioned in the beginning. Fermi is made of two telescopes, one devoted to the highest energies, up to hundreds of GB, so just 10 uh, or around the energy to which CTA will start to operate, and uh, a low energy instrument typical, similar to Batsy or extending to slightly upper, uh, larger energies. So Fermi detected a few gamma ray bursts, but I would like to mention this one, 27 of April, 2013. And this burst had, look here, 10 to the 6 for counts per second in these uh, energies. So this is an incredibly bright emission, an incredibly bright. And so there was a hope to detect at least this one for uh, very high energy emission. Unfortunately, it was full moon. And that it was not possible to detect it in very high energy. You see that these uh, had also the, uh, the first page of science because these lasted in this uh, GV energy range uh, up to 10 to the 4 or even 10 to the 5 seconds. So this was really a monster in uh, the science. So, of course, uh, this burst uh, was quite interesting because it had several photons uh, that were not. Uh, uh, could not be explainable by the model that I showed before, these jets uh, emitting. Uh, photons through a synchrotron emission. So this uh, raised several questions to the modelers that are still open. I will come back to this question later on, if, uh, if there will be time. So of course, uh, there was full moon, uh, and only one telescope could point to that uh, in the day after. This was Veritas. Uh, and Veritas placed just very nice upper limits on the extrapolation of this uh, model that I mentioned, so uh, upscattering of photons. Uh, emitted by synchrotron emission, which is the typical model that is uh, used to explain gamma ray burst emission by the energetic electrons that emit them, which is called self-synchrotron content. And they placed some upper limits. So we were really unlucky. So there was quite, uh, let's say, <laughs> discouragement in the, in the field because it appeared that uh, no one was able to get gamma ray burst. So you can think that this party was really longly expected. But eventually this happened. And this happened in the date that I say before. So this was an astronomy telegram that the magic te uh, collaboration issued. You see, this was really deeply in the night when this was discovered. So it was on 15 of January 2019. This is why I said 15 of January, because it was the first time that this was announced. And this was uh, possible thanks uh, to several improvements in the magic uh, data analysis techniques, uh, in the magic telescope itself. So this was really an historical observation. And how it is quite important, because you see, this is uh, also a technical plot, but this is the swift bat light curve with the, the counts that goes down. These are smoothly goes da going down as in the afterglow. Magic received the alert uh, 20 seconds, then started to track uh, the telescope, the, the alert just a few seconds after due to the movement. Uh, this moved, the telescope moved from the alert to the tracking that started to track uh, the source. The data acquisition started uh, just a few seconds after. 
And then magic observed the, the flux of photon per centimeter per squared at this energy that is declining line in the afterglow. So the, this was really the confirmation that the gamma reverse are really emitting at these TV energies. And you see that this is a similar graph to before. These are the synchrotron, synchrotron models for gamma reverse. And these energies, you see, uh, these are hundreds of photons at energies greater than uh, 20 or 30 GV. Let's say there are, let's say, not explicable with synchrotron emission only. So this, uh, uh, this is another publication of MAGIC uh, that uh, shows, apart from the scientific values, uh, shows how many other instruments from radio to X-ray to optical to high energy, LAT uh, and uh, let's say GBM on board Fermi, also Agile Mini Calorimeter, how many of them contributed to this very nice uh, paper, which shows that uh, the MAGIC light curve, the XRT light curve, they follow always, uh, all of them, they follow the same decline in, in time versus uh, their flux. So this points to a common origin of these two uh, emissions. The same was true with the, the same excitement, I should say, because in the same nature issue, when uh, MAGIC published uh, its, its result, uh, also HES, uh, the HES collaboration, published another, and as you said, uh, in the same, uh, with the same interest, uh, because this is a totally different regime. So you see that MAGIC detected the gamma reburst around 100 seconds after the burst, while HES, let's say, had the opportunity to see that, to this, this burst, probably again due to moon constraints or whatever, just, let's say, the, the, the day after. And so it detected that, let's say, 10 to the to a few times, 10 to the four seconds after the burst, so deeply in the afterglow, when no one, thought that still get, there could be the very high energy emission. So this uh, detection by Hess is equally important for gamma reverse trials. And this is still important for CTA because we will follow this gamma reverse for such a long time after this Hess detection. Hess, let's say MAGIC published together in the same Nature uh, issue. And uh, uh, Nature asked another colleague of us to publish a news and views article where this emission is currently explained. So these are electrons emitting photons. They help scatter the synchrotron photon to higher energies in the synchrotron plus self-synchrotron Compton emission. This was uh, the model at that time. Unfortunately, it's not till uh, the end of the story because Hess detected another gamma ray burst much closer to us, which is uh, the 29th of August, 2019. So. 29 will be, <laughs> uh, 2019, sorry, will be uh, re uh, reminded as the year of gamma ray burst at very high energy. And this was detected, and you see that uh, uh, has detected in following nights, is the first night, the second night, and the third night. So this was really an incredible uh, detection, I should say, because uh, this, uh, the, the burst was detected for such long time. And... Uh, the plot that uh, the HES is showing is that it is still questioning the model for self-synchrotron emission. And so this is still an active debate uh, ongoing. So the discovery of very high energy emission from gamma ray burst really was an enthusiastic uh, enthusiasm to all of us. Uh, and this motivates much more the transient key science project for CTA. So CTA will have uh, several projects. Uh, one uh, of them is devoted to the extreme astrophysical environments. Uh, so physics of relativistic jets, stellar explosions, these are the ones that are related to the gamma ray burst. And this is why we have one specific project, which is the follow-up of transient events, also together with the multi-messenger analysis. So these, these transient phenomena also uh, put the design, uh, let's say, drive, drew the design of CTA. And you see that we had to prepare an instrument that was able to rapidly review in 10, 20 seconds in order to catch as much as possible the, let's say, the uh, emission from gamma ray burst. And we have to go down to low energy also because the very much distant sources cannot be seen at the highest energy where CTA is more sensitive. And all the other, let's say, with much more sensitivity, with a large field of view will help uh, to catch uh, gamma ray burst to not very well located. So these are uh, the current estimate. Uh, you see this is very uh, another sorry technical plot. Uh, you see that uh, in one minute, uh, CTA in its current uh, northern array uh, description will be 
able to catch, if it will be able to be there in one minute, of course, a source which is much more faint than what Fermilab detected. Also in 10 minutes, this is because uh, the CTA is much more sensitive than Fermi. So there is really an expectation to catch gamma ray burst if we will be able to point to this uh, in less than 10 minutes. So this is not uh, the last uh, word of the story, because the last word is that if uh, we get uh, an alert from other telescope uh, that the gamma ray burst exploded, we have to be able to rapidly react uh, to repoint to the burst, to start track uh, the telescope, as I showed you for magic, uh, but also to get uh, some real answer. Because you can imagine that if CTA will detect the prompt emission of gamma ray burst, this will be also an historical point. Uh, and so we'll uh, promise uh, to, let's say, say back uh, to the other observatories in the world uh, that if we have detected uh, a gamma ray burst. So this will be, we will be really to be fast. You understand why I'm, <laughs> I was telling don't panic, but this we have to be prepared. One of the previous of a former coordinator of the transient working group, he said, be prepared to the unexpected. So expect the unexpected, Dr. Suzumu Inoue. He was mentioned this sentence many, many times. And I think he's, he was right. He's still right. So the key science project has several of these key science questions that you might even read it, which is the physical mechanism that drive gamma ray burst, the most luminous explosions in the universe. And uh, let's say, what are the sources of gravitational waves? This is something that will be addressed in the next step of our journey. So let me go down finally to uh, what I said, that these science cases really design the possibility of detecting uh, the gamma ray burst. So namely the largest telescope, the LSTs. That is, this is already the first LST operating in La Palma, and we hope to add the, the next one in the next years, then the years to come, to start observing really with the full capabilities and to catch the first gamma ray burst by CTA. So I will just conclude my, my webinar, just saying a few words about the other transients. The first one is the multi-messenger connection, because Fermi GBM detected one short gamma ray burst, 17 of August 17, was a a burst like many of the others, and LIGO and Virgo detected a few seconds, two seconds before a signal that is associated with the merger of neutral stars. So this was the confirmation of the other sources of gamma ray burst for the short one, which is not related to the explosion of a single star, but to the merger of two neutron stars. So hopefully, let's say this will happen also in the CTA era when someone will locate the location of the gamma ray burst, maybe we, we ourselves, and uh, to repoint the other telescope and make the big discoveries that were made for the uh, 17 of August emission. So the progenitors for short gamma ray burst are indeed uh, the, um, let's say, the major of two neutron stars. Now it is quite uh, sure that they are these ones. So just as a summary, so the long gamma ray bursts are the explosion of a single star, more or less, this is the common view, and the short gamma ray bursts are the merger of two neutron stars, possibly, now it is certainly neutron stars, I should say. So the CTA transient KSP will have several time to get, this is what we wrote, and we are still going to see that in the, in the next years to see if this, let's say, what we will devote, the time that we will devote to that. But I have not completed, because if you see here, there are other transients, so serendipitous galactic transients, where, let's say, we designed to have several hours per year per one of the two sites of CTA. So what are they? So I said that I will mention two of them, the flaring Crab Nebula and the Novi. So what are they? So I should say that the, the Crab Nebula was another excitement that I, I witnessed in these years. And this is because both of the satellites, Agile and Fermi, witnessed an increased emission from the Crab Nebula. The Crab Nebula is the remnant of the explosion that is a supernova that exploded in, let's say, in the year 1054. So 1,000 years ago. So how it can be that such a nebula increased this emission? You have to imagine like the sun that, let's say, for all of a sudden, let's say, increase its light, which is not possible. So still, this was not, it was not credible by anyone. And when we saw this 
increased emission. This was in, uh, let's say, as I said, uh, in the, uh, 20, let's say, uh, 16, uh, if, I'm not, uh, if I'm not wrong. We were, we were uh, sorry, 29. Uh, we went back uh, to our old data and we found that in 27, when Agile was launched, uh, let's say we found another emission of uh, increased emission from the crab. This is the spectrum all, all over the multivalent of the crab, and the increased emission is just in the MEV to GV range. No emission, no increased emission was seen by TV experiment. But of course, this is not yet clear if it is true or if CTA will detect that. You can imagine that uh, this is uh, largely much larger than what crab normally emits. So the, I think that this uh, will be one of the most important uh, uh, discoveries that uh, maybe uh, CTA will make. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, this is uh, just a picture to explain why this is not possible, because we have a star that exploded. There's a supernova that is going away. Then we have uh, an old object, a pulsar, at uh, the beginning, rotating around itself. Uh, and there is a nebula powered by the wind of particles emitted by the pulsar. So there are no energetic energy sources that can power an explosion, like a flare, like the one that Agile and Fermi detected. But there was another surprise. Uh, and now this uh, can be attributed only to Fermi, because uh, this was a discovery by, by Fermi in 2010. Uh, you see there's a part of the galactic sky. Fermi uh, was observing that. And you see that uh, here there is nothing. Then uh, just, uh, let's say, 10, 10 days uh, uh, corresponding to the previous one, there is this source, uh, which was not, uh, so, was not seen before. And this is a novi. So there is uh, an explosion happening on a white dwarf, so another kind of uh, end of the stellar object due to material coming from a binary companion. And this uh, powers an explosion, and this explosion can hit uh, the parent star and emit uh, gamma rays in the GV. What is nice, uh, and I can imagine the excitement by the S colleagues, uh, is that uh, Hess, a few, let's say, months ago, in August 2021, so this year, detected a very high energy emission from this one of the other novas, so this recurrent nova RS of Yuki. So this is currently one of the other excitement that we have in the field. Working on transient, you can imagine why I'm so enthusiastic of the field, is that you, you, you never stop to learn, because, uh, let's say, you might think that you have understood everything, uh, and uh, the novae were not expected to emit very high energy, indeed, uh, has detected them. So I think that this is something really yeah, very nice uh, to be to be witnessing, as I said before. So I have uh, almost concluded because I would like to say a few words, but because I think that in the next webinar, um, uh, Professor Sarah Mar Markov will say more about that. Uh, is that uh, also uh, there was a kind of quite a large of excitement because uh, at some point uh, both Fermi and the TV telescope uh, saw and also Agile saw an AGN that was flaring was in an active state. Uh, an AGN is a black hole hosted at the center of an external galaxy. And this was seen flaring and was seen within the error box of a neutrino. So these neutral particles that are very elusive and they require a big telescope one kilometer cube under the ice of the Antarctica. So this was the signature of the neutrino seen by the ice cube detector. And in its error box, both Fermi and Magic, here I'm showing one of the first plots, you see that here there is a, this AGN in the error box of the neutrino. So this was the first confirmation of that neutrino can be produced by particles, probably protons, accelerated by the AGN flares. These are another kind of transients that were explained in the webinar on the extragalactic sky, but they are multi-messenger sources. So they are transient, and you see that transients are really keeping together galactic sources extragalactic sources, and really multi-messenger events. So they are a really a key science topic for CTA. So just a few words, uh, let's say, of the scoop that I was promising to you about uh, the very high energy, the new era. What is new, this new era? This new era is the so-called fast radio burst. These are signals detected by big radio telescopes that are a very short duration, one millisecond. There are different types uh, Nowadays, uh, we still don't know their origin. There are several, several uh, models. They are like uh, the time when I started to do this kind of science. So in the early era of gamma ray burst, 
where there are several models on the market uh, and uh, there are still no decisive, decisive, decisive uh, observation that can distinguish among them. One of them came a uh, few, uh, or let's say a few years ago, when, uh, let's say, the integral EB satellite that also contributed to the gravitational wave counterpart emission, he, it detected an X-ray emission coherent with the same similar, very similar time structure from a fast radio burst from uh, a galactic sources. Uh, this is uh, named SGR 1935 plus 21. This is uh, the magnetic field, the, 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 the neutral star with the huge magnetic field that I was mentioning uh, in the early models uh, for galactic gamma ray burst that emits a flare. These uh, might uh, collide and emit uh, X-rays and then in the shock front radio wave. So you see that there are several, several models that might connect this magnetar with the fast radio burst. So the fast radio burst will be also followed by, by CTA, I hope. The only problem that I might see is that uh, the radio telescope, uh, they pinpoint a uh, few of them, but because they are very small field of view, so they are much more numerous. If the gamma ray burst is there is one per night, uh, these in number can be up to 1,000 per night. So you might think why it is a new era in very high energy transient, because we will have to decide where to point. So CTA, just a conclusion, will open a new era in very high energy astrophysics. Uh, and the full exploitation of CTA science case requires multi-wavelength and multi-messenger synergies, from uh, optical to millimeter to radio waves uh, to neutrinos to gravitational wave to X-rays. And the high hope that CTA will be soon operating and see you soon to catch uh, our marvelous transient sky. Thanks uh, to, to you for, for your attention. Thanks a lot, uh, Francesco, for this extremely nice historical and scientific context on the field. It's very exciting field, as you as you mentioned. Really looking forward to see what CTA can do in this in this direction. So, just a reminder, everybody, if you have questions or comments for Francesco, we are going to start now the the question and answer session. So don't be shy and go to the Facebook and YouTube channels. You can uh, you can send there your your comments. Um, meanwhile, I actually have a couple of, of uh, questions. Um, one is more a, a, a comment for you to to explain to the audience. So the gamma ray burst just last few seconds, they are extremely uh, fast and we need telescopes that move really fast, as you mentioned. The large size telescope is going to be able to point to any part of the sky in just 20 seconds, no? Really? But, uh, That's true. So actually, before the uh, burst advocate, the job that you mentioned, the first one knowing about that are the operators on the on the site. So I think it would be uh, uh, nice to, to discuss with the audience, to explain to the audience how an operator would need <laughs> to react, what they need to do. How yes, they yes. That, that is coming and how it's related to, to the uh, burst advocate. Yes, thanks, Alta. This is a very nice question. And indeed, this don't panic is not for the burst advocate, which is, let's say, normally, for example, during the night, you are nicely sleeping, but it is for the operators because uh, CTA will also have a transient handler that will receive the information that the gamma reverse happened. And this will immediately steer the telescope toward the direction of the of the telescope uh, and uh, the operators will be notified. And actually they are notified if they are on site like on Magic and Hess uh, and Veritas too, I hope, uh, I think. Uh, and uh, they are notified that the telescope immediately is new and they have to, let's say, to be excited because they have to see whether the, the telescope pointed to the right direction. They have to call during the night, the burst advocate, you have to call maybe one, two times uh, because he or she are sleeping. And uh, the burst advocate then will have to guide uh, the operator to continue or not. So, for example, if uh, sometimes it happened that the gamma ray burst are af just after, let's say, half an hour or an hour are not, uh, let's say, confirmed, uh, so you can stop uh, the observation. The burst advocate can go <laughs> to sleep again and the operator can continue their observation. But of course, uh, they have to react quickly to see whether all the procedures, the automatic procedure, happened properly. You don't have to lose. The, the first time of the observation, because uh, as I explained, uh, nowadays uh, just the afterglow was seen. No uh, TV uh, Cherenkov telescope yet detected the prompt emission. This will be 
the uh, holy grail, holy grail, and grail of the of the uh, GRB science in very high energy. So to catch uh, really the prompt emission. If we will, new let's say science will be opened. So we hope we catch that with the <laughs> CDA. <laughs> Hopefully, yes. For the for the long duration, I hope that this will be possible. Okay, uh, and actually, I have another question. We were talking that the gamma ray bars can be extremely uh, far away, and I would actually uh, I, I wanted to ask you which is the farthest gamma ray bars we have ever detected, and how far can CTA uh, see? It's going to change the view in that uh, perspective. The farthest gamma ray burst that was seen uh, was seen by by Swift uh, was triggered by by Swift. Uh, and it is as far as 13, so one three point something, uh, let's say billion uh, light years. So it is really almost at the beginning of the universe. Really, it is really, 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 really far away. <laughs> so this happened, let's say, once every 10 to or something like years in, in uh, let's say, the scientist time. And this really was one of the first stars that exploded. Due to some constraints uh, that were explained in the extragalactic uh, webinar, we cannot see such uh, very large distances. Uh, and I think that uh, there were simulation in our key science project uh, uh, document uh, that see that we can see gamma reversed up to very high, uh, very high redshift, so very large distances, uh, which is somehow much farther away than uh, the current one. And uh, the distances for which we can see will be somehow and let me say a number, the, um, the uh, scientists quote the distances naming the number of uh, so-called redshift, uh, which is how the universe, how the galaxies are, uh, let's say, going away from us. So the farthest gamma ray burst uh, seen so far, it is redshift around one, and uh, CTA will be able to see at least gamma ray burst up to, three, to two and even more. The simulation showed that uh, if we were able to see the GRB that Fermi detected in 28, we might be able to see to reach even Z equal four, but it is still being uh, confirmed in this day. Okay, so thanks a lot, uh, Francesco. Uh, I do not see any uh, further comments on the chat, so I'm going to close here the webinar. Thanks again for this uh, fantastic uh, webinar. And just for the audience, thank you for joining us uh, today. And a reminder, next month we have the last stop of the journey with Sera Markov talking about the multi-wavelength and multi-messenger universe, as Francesco mentioned today. So do not miss it. Follow us on social media to stay tuned. So with that, thanks a lot to everybody. Thank you, Francesco. Ciao, ciao. Ciao.